I want to welcome to the program Father Mike O'Connor. He is the pastor of Our Lady of the Gulf Catholic Church in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Welcome, Father. It's great to have you. It's great to be part of the uh, part of the podcast. I'm truly yeah. privileged. Oh, this is this is it's, it's tremendous, Father. I have had a chance to watch some of your homilies online, uh, which is a beautiful gift. So, first of all, thank you for your willingness to do that. I don't know if when you signed up to be pastor there, your pulpit's going to reach a wider congregation. Did you have any idea? Well, you know, um, before we started the YouTube ministry, we had a, a, a pod beam, um, you know, basically recording the homilies, just the voice and putting them out there. And then when the, when the pandemic hit, that's when we took our RCIA filming setup and said, let's bring it into the church since the church was no longer able to host a full congregation. And, uh, and it unfolded very organically. So did I imagine that we were going to be doing this? Not really, but I guess part of me hoped that uh, we could use the modern media to, uh, to, to proclaim the gospel. Yes. Well, Father Mike, what I love about your story is that you didn't chase it. You weren't like how you said it happened organically. I'm going to use the word providentially. I, I just love that the Lord is saying, you know what? I can take even something like COVID lockdowns and I'm going to use them for my glory. I'm going to do something beautiful so that my word is still heard and my word resounds. And so the ability to use platforms like YouTube to be able to get the fullness of our, our the teaching of the church out and, and spoken in a way that's receivable by the people of God is, again, it's a beautiful gift. So Father Mike, when you um, when you started in on this, one of the things that stands out in your preaching and the homilies that you give is that you don't hold back. You know, I, I talk about quite often the need to stand up, speak out and push back. And doing that, not by bringing our own ideas to the table, but rather letting the fullness of the church's teaching be brought to bear on the pressing issues of the day when there's so much at stake. Is that something that uh, is sort of natural to you that, to speak in ways that are, let's call it prophetic. There's a prophetic edge to many of your messages. And I don't know if that was something that you're like, finally, my personality gets to come out or was it more, well, I am called as a herald to speak the truth. And so it is what it is. Well, you know, going back to the idea of, of being a priest in the first place, it's like, um, why am I going to be a priest? Why am I going to sacrifice uh, certain parts of the gift of life to serve Christ at the altar and at the pulpit and then do it in a way that uh, is not in its fullness? And, and again, my experience as a, a Catholic growing up was, um, you know, I don't think I was radically challenged to live my faith. You know, how being radically challenged to live my faith happened, really, Mother Angelic had a little bit to do with that and her media uh, and her willingness to be bold. And, and so I realized very early on that the, the message of the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, when I was challenged to read the gospels for the first time myself, the man that I met in the gospel, our Lord, was much more bold, much more um, divisive, frankly, much more passionate, much more manly than the, the, the gospel that I, I think that uh, I had been fed. For, for a lot of my life. And so I was hopeful that uh, you can let, we could let the words of Jesus speak for themselves, honestly. That's all we have to do. And um, so prophetic, you know, when we're baptized, what are we baptized? Priest, prophet, and king. And so each one of us has a responsibility to be a prophet. And to be a prophet is first and foremost to speak the truth. OK, and and when we see the truth in the light of the Holy Spirit, we can almost see how the world is going to unfold. And so that uh, I would hope and I mean this and, and I, with the humility that I would hope that all of us would recognize the, the gift and the responsibility to be prophetic. 
Well, Father Mike, I think that you, I love how you put it. It's a graced duty. It's a graced duty. But I wonder about the virtue of courage, because a lot of folks will shrink in front of a duty, even if they feel prompted to do so. There's a cowering down. And I think that courage comes from um, following leaders who show the way, who point the way, who walk before us. And so you use Jesus as the perfect example, the one whom you as a priest imitate. You imitate Christ, the high priest, and you do so with great courage. And I say that a lot of the laity will become emboldened to fulfill their grace duty when they see those who stand forward with courage to fulfill uh, what it is we're asked to do. Now, Father, you you have a background that involves the military. And Correct. do you yeah. feel like that was um, sort of the, it, it got burnt into you, formed or forged into you through the fire to say, you know, that's all you got, bring it on, you know, the, the yeah. spirit of courage? Was there anything to do with maybe that background at all? Well, you know, one of the things in, in my, the environment in which I, I worked in the military was um, we would have these uh, after action reports or debriefings. And, uh, you know, it was uh, bare knuckles in a sense. You know, it, people could be very, very pointed in their criticism and in their um, expectation of professionalism and competence. Okay. And so that idea, you know, has to be, you know, part of every professional, uh, is, you know, again, it's not going to be the same environment of giving people feedback and the kind of language that you might hear in a military debriefing, or even on a football sideline, you know, if you ever watch a sports and one of the players really messes up and the coach gives them a, a little piece of his mind, it's like, you know, we have to be able to speak candidly, okay, and, and, and in love. I heard a priest friend of mine say this, you know, we can't punch people with the truth, okay, and so it, it, it won't do them any good, but we have to make the truth available to them to reject if they so choose it, you know, and if I don't do that, St. Augustine, in the Liturgy of the Hours, has a letter that he writes about pastors being mute dogs that don't bark, you know, about eating the, 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 the meat of the lamb and clothing themselves with the wool, but not tending them. And, and that, when I read that, you talk about, you know, use the word courageous. The Lord have mercy on me, a sinner, because I recognize that all too often I'm not as courageous as I could be or should be or maybe even feel called to be. Uh, so I'm working on it. I'm working on courage and going back to the kind of military model, you know, of, of having, of not being ever afraid in every moment to hurt somebody's tender feelings. Okay. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings ever, but if that's the, if that is the measure of my homilies, or my pastoral teaching, or my marriage prep, then, you know, you know, did Jesus, did John the Baptist, did St. Peter and St. Paul, was that their measure of pastoral guidance? Was, I might, somebody's feelings might get hurt today, you know? And, and again, I take people's feelings very seriously, but at the same time, yeah, maybe so. Maybe in the military, I was taught, you know, if your feelings get hurt, you'll get over it. Well, Father, I, again, I'm talking with Father Michael O'Connor. He's the pastor of Our Lady of the Gulf in a Catholic church in, um, what's the name of the city? Bay St. Louis. Bay St. Louis. I, I, I got to remember that bay. Bay yeah, St. Louis. Named after the, the same king of France, Bay St. Louis. Oh, really? Louis. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Bay St. Louis, uh, Mississippi. And, and Father, one of the things that uh, I'd love to get your insight on is the way in which Catholics today are finding sources of inspiration, refreshment, and deepening of their faith is often the liturgy. And today there can be a, a bit of contention between very fervent Catholics who promote the traditional Latin Mass as a 
healthier, fuller, more reverent way of celebrating the sacred liturgy. Um, compared to those who say, no, the, the Novus Ordo Mass, the Mass in English that comes from the Second Vatican Council, is an authentic way of celebrating the liturgy. And how have you navigated that, that, um, that, that let's call those two different rails of, of how Catholics today are finding life in the liturgy? You know, um, first of all, I have the great privilege of uh, celebrating uh, the, the Novus Ordo Mass, and I do it as reverently as I can. And I remember when I was in the seminary, the first time that I experienced a, a priest celebrating the Novus Ordo in a way that was um, incredibly reverent, incredibly um, you know, well thought out, and had a mood to it. And I thought to myself, I want to celebrate Mass like that, you know, and it was, it was a new experience to me. And... Um, and so, and I've been complimented, you know, thanks be to God, uh, over the years of my priesthood by people who say they like the way I celebrate Mass. I'm sure that there are people who don't like the way I celebrate Mass, and they don't tell me after Mass, I don't like, you seem uptight up there, or whatever it might be. I'm sure that there are those who don't. So, Novus Ordo, and then recently, I had the great privilege of celebrating the um, extraordinary form you know, the old mass. And that was a, a great experience for me to, to, uh, to have that. And I think what people want more than anything, they want good liturgy. They might not even know that they want good liturgy, but they want good liturgy. And when they experience it, most people will immediately recognize that there is something transcendent happening. I think think for a variety of reasons, the old mass lends itself more readily to transcendence. Okay. To, you know, we talk about the vertical and the horizontal dimensions of worship. And so that transcendence is what's so often missing. And then we have uh, that uh, in, in, a, in a lot of Novus Ordo liturgies. And frankly, that was, I think, part of the architecture of the Novus Ordo Liturgy was to make it more, more palatable for this generation. Now, the contention. I, I, it's sad that there's contention because I do think in the hope of Pope Benedict XVI that they can exist and to the degree that it is possible, mutually enrich one another. But people that are serious about coming to God and having an encounter with God in worship, I think can find that in the Novus Ordo. They may have to look harder and they can find it in the, um, in the old mass. Now, we're having the whole mass here at my parish. Thanks be to God, still allowed to do that. Um, you know, there are people that come and they experience it one time. They're like, not for me, you know, not for me. And, uh, and so, so I've experienced that from good, well-meaning Catholics that love good liturgy, but they go and they just say, it's just not for me, you know? So I don't know if I've answered your question or not, but I think it's out there. I think good liturgy is out there, but you have to look for it. Yeah. Father Mike, you know, uh, you, when you were saying this, I'm, I'm, I'm nodding my head. I, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, so having done church work now for 34 years, I found in the first, call them almost 30 years, the emphasis was how do we make the sacred liturgy more relevant to those who would come in? So the emphasis was retain the identity of the sacred liturgy, be true to it in its essence, but make it relevant, make it more accessible and meaningful uh, palatable was the word you used. And what I didn't realize enough in, in the emphasis that I took and others that were sort of in movements that were attempting to draw people deeper into their Catholic faith or to the Catholic faith was that relevance sometimes 
went into being casual. It was, uh, it was too accessible. And there's something about the inaccessibility of divinity. There's something about holiness. You use the word transcendence. The presence of God evokes reverence. Right? So reverence is all about responding to that which is showing up, the one who is showing up, the divinity that is present. And what I've what I've sort of wrestled with in, in the spirit of the horizontal and the vertical that you've referred to is how do we uh, encompass all of those goods of fostering the reverence that's required because divinity is present and therefore holiness is appropriate in us to the Holy One who's there, while at the same time having it be accessible in a meaningful way so that it's relevant to those who are coming. And I, I don't know if that's the tension that, that's going to exist and maybe Novus Ordo is going to tend towards the relevant and the traditional Latin mass towards the reverent, but th I think they're meant to come together. I, I could not agree more. And, you know, if you're, you know, the one size fits all. Okay, we in the in the Latin church can think, well, one size fit all for, you know, however many centuries. And why do we need the Novus Ordo and the traditional mass, someone might say. And then others might say, you know, why do why would you want to go back to that? You know, why would you want to go back to that? But I do think that this mutual enrichment, this finding people in different places in their spiritual journey, different places in their temperament, isn't necessarily something that is uh, radically new to Catholicism, as we recognize there are many rites in the church. There are many liturgical traditions in the church, um, you know, just, and, and, and most of them are, are, are more um, foreign to modern Western sensibilities than, uh, than, or at least as foreign as the, uh, as the, as the old mass goes. But I, yes, finding a way to bring somebody in that can off the street have some idea of what's happening and then be able to usher them into a place if it is their, their interior, if it is who they are, um, that would be more more clearly, if you use the word kind of the hidden divinity, that mystery of something happening here that appeals to, to I think, uh, the nature of God itself that we recognize mm -hmm. is, uh, is somewhat that God has to come to us. And that's one of the things that I love about the symbolism of the Eucharist coming over the altar rail to the person that Christ comes to us in this way that he is both imminent and transcendent. And I think a bit of that is lost in the Novus Ordo. I do, but you know, um, we're working with what we got. Yeah. Well, I'm talking again with Father Michael Connor, the pastor of Our Lady of the Gulf in uh, Catholic Church in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Uh, Father Mike has a, a wonderful YouTube channel. If you just type in his name, uh, Father Michael Connor, you'll get to his YouTube channel, or you can go to the to the parish website as well, uh, which is olgchurch.net, uh, Our Lady of the Gulf, olgchurch.net, uh, in order to get access to his homilies and his YouTube channel. Father Mike, one of the things you were talking about was this coming together. When I think about how the church is called to engage with the world, to accomplish its mission, to evangelize today in a world that is so marked by the flatness of a secular vision that lacks that sense of transcendence. It seems to me that one of the ways that God is doing that is through signs and wonders, through supernatural inbreaking, through making the supernatural dimension, again, this transcendence, more obvious. And I think that the traditional Latin mass is one of the gifts that God has brought back out into the open in our time to help recover that sense of God 
the God who is beyond the world broken into this world. But I also look at movements that have an expectant faith for the Holy Spirit to move in power, that the Holy Spirit moving in power in people's lives in even miraculous ways, gifting them with spiritual power to undertake the works of the apostolate, it seems to me that that's one of the ways that the Lord is going to grab people's attention who feel like I've heard religious messages and they're just flat. So there's no breaking in. What are your thoughts about that? I, I absolutely agree that the Holy Spirit is at work touching people's lives in, um, in a personal and radical way. And that's happening. And I see this, you know, that you called it the flatness of the secular vision of, of humanity, frankly, and our destiny, um, that people um, are, are experiencing that. And some of them, frankly, are going the path of despair. Okay. And then there are the others who begin their seeking. And, you know, I don't think that Jesus was kidding us when he tells us, seek and you will find knock and the door will be open ask and you will receive so people with this hunger this authentic hunger and that they're having an experience of god just very very quick story of a of a man that i know who is around 50 years old and really lived a life of 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 debauchery okay in, in new orleans as a as a um as a bartender but nonetheless, he was raised as a Catholic in another city far away, moved to New Orleans one way or another, and then one day just basically heard, you need to go to church, like that, you know, and then went to church, and then sometime later, you need to go to confession, okay, went to confession, and then had this mystical experience of God, this radical, and his life is totally transformed i mean to the pursuit of virtue the pursuit of holiness all of this and really nothing that he said i think i need to read these self-help books it was very much like the holy spirit zapped him if you will so that's happening there's no doubt in my mind that in the midst of the sea of chaos that we see around us god is working now now am i impatient for it to be more to happen faster am i impatient for the liturgy to be reformed more quickly am i impatient for uh, a raising up of a great multitude of priests to bring in the harvest uh, and religious i am impatient for that i am but i do see the hand of god at work and i and i am i am confident that he has not abandoned us so father mike one of the areas that um i think will um, will help foster some of the renewal that you're talking about is the fraternity among priests. So I had the, the blessing of studying in the seminary for five years, was not ordained, left a year before ordination and have been serving the church. But in those five years, I heard, I don't know how many homilies, talks, spiritual conferences, retreats, how many classes, lectures on all kinds of topics. But it's stunning um, what happens if you ever sat down and made a list of topics that were never discussed, things that were never heard about in the in the seminary. I did it one time and I came up with about 30 topics, including things like spiritual warfare and uh, the power of the Holy Spirit at work in people's lives today, right? Things like that. And I'm wondering if part of um, the call of priests like you is to lean on and look to and, and be brothers with other priests to foster that sense of that stirring in the flame, that, that sense of there's more. Come on, brother priest, let's stand together. Let's lead courageously. Let's, let's uh, let the church be large in, in, in society today, that sort of thing. Do you find um, a sense of brotherly support in, in your own priesthood? to help support, encourage, and keep you accountable? 
I, I do. I'm very, very fortunate in that um, I made some good friends in seminary and that we have remained good friends over, I've been ordained 17 years over the years, and, uh, and we, we will check in with one another. We go on vacation every year. But just so happens, just coincidentally, I had lunch yesterday with a guy from seminary who, uh, who was taking a couple days off and someone gave him a, um, a condo here in uh, not far. Bay St. Louis is right, as you can imagine, on a bay. Okay, so he was staying not far away. And so we had lunch together and we were talking and, and it was very much about encouraging each other in preaching boldly and uh, you know, self-care and spiritual warfare. He came from a very charismatic kind of uh, childhood. His parents were, uh, were in the charismatic movement. And so that was part of his life. So, but yeah, we need each other. We really do. And, and you mentioned earlier about examples of boldness at the very beginning of our, of our conversation and, uh, and the hope that, that the bold preaching would embolden the laity. And, you know, um, and this may not make it in the final cut of our, our conversation, but, you know, there was a kind of era of McCarrickism in, in the episcopacy, okay? And, and that, that non-confrontational, um, very, um, let's just kind of trust that the culture is a good thing and, and really some, and some darkness and deception in leadership in the church, that spirit really undermined the boldness and um, of of priests and laity, for that matter. There's a there is um, the biological solution is taking its toll on that <laughs> on that uh, that the strata of leadership that was formed to be non-confrontational you know, and, and really did a tremendous harm both in the United States and in the world. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, Father, I, uh, so I've had a chance to work with bishops for, since the early 90s, and I say one of the best, uh, the number one uh, quality that makes someone attracted, uh, makes someone a good candidate to be a bishop, makes them a lousy bishop, and that is that they don't rock the boat that they're a company man, that they stay in line, that they uh, are someone that is accustomed to being deferential to the one in front of them. So they essentially spend their priesthood, um, you know, towing the line and being very comfortable, you know, carrying water for the bishop in front of them. And that works in an age that is marked by uh, the strength of Christendom, in an age that is marked by strong faith in, in the culture that in which we live is um, supportive of Judeo-Christian values and a vision, then it's okay. You don't need prophetic evangelizing uh, bishops out there standing against so many trends happening. Well, I would have said a couple of years ago in the McCarrick moment really caused scales to fall from the eyes that we don't live in that kind of moment. Christendom is past for the most part. And I used to say we lived in an Elijah moment where it's how long will you straddle the issue if the Lord is God, follow him, if Baal, follow him, you know, the 450 prophets. I, I feel that way. I, I, I'm interested to hear what you have to say, where we are. Yeah. So I'd say that in, in the people didn't respond. Right. And then the God who answers with fire is God. But I'm not even there anymore. I don't think we're in, even in an Elijah moment. I think we're in a the house is on fire moment that. You, you go back 20 years to when you were ordained 17 years ago and the house wasn't on fire, right? You could go drive through the neighborhood and everything's fine. And so you could preach the gospel and be nice and go to the cookout. When the house is on fire, you don't have time to hang out. You got to knock the door down. You got to go and you got to shake people up out of their sleep. And you've got to say, come with me right now or you will die. That there's too much at stake. Your kids, your kids room is on fire. You've got to go rescue your kids or they're going to die in the fire. And if I don't tell you that, then I'm responsible. That's, a, again, Augustine's pastoral uh, letter to pastors. 
So I, I, I believe, and, and, and now I actually talk quite a bit on the radio about talking from that standpoint that the house is on fire and, and I have to warn people that the house is on fire. Um, you know, maybe I recognize, I, I certainly do uh, recognize that the house is on fire, that there is um, incredible damage has been done, okay? I think we're still in an Elijah moment. I do think that we, how much longer can you straddle the issue? You know, the chief, chief executive of the United States is somehow keeping a foot in both camps. I don't know how that's possible, but, but it's not going to be possible for much longer. Okay. Either you're, either you're Catholic or you're not Catholic. And when that's going to be made so clear to people, uh, I don't know. But the other thing is, is, you know, Jesus speaks in the gospels uh, uh, about um, basically, you know, you have to trim back the dead off of the, of the shrub if you wanted to, to. And we haven't, there's been no trimming back of the dead. And so the dead branches are having to fall off themselves, okay? And it's taken a long time, okay? And they've sucked a lot of energy out of the shrub, okay? And we would say that, the, that it's on fire. Well, I would say that yes, yes, it's always been on fire. Since St. Paul was preaching at the Areopagus, it's been on fire, okay? But something good is happening too. Something Amen. good is happening. The, the dead branches are beginning to wither off on their own. Uh, maybe we'll, you know, and again, Lord have mercy on me a sinner. Okay, Lord have mercy on me a sinner. Lord have mercy on me a sinner. But uh, so it is. Um, well, Father, here, I'm going to share. I like what you're saying. So I think that uh, I'm going to let me let me advance my thought here uh -huh. that there are sectors in our society where the you can still drive down and join the cookout. There are sectors where it's the Elijah moment and you've got to choose if the Lord is God, follow him, if not. And there are other th other issues where the house is on fire. So maybe it's a matter of like where we are living. Like I think about teens and the internet and smartphones, the house is on fire. Fire. I think about transgender medical uh, malpractice being uh, uh, imposed upon kids without their parents' notification. The house is on fire. Abortion, the house is on fire. But then there are these other, so many issues where you're right. It is a matter of, am I going to be more American or more Catholic in how I live, that Elijah moment? So I, I think you're right. Uh, I want to give you one other uh, little insight I got. I was doing a training in Jamaica, and a woman got up and gave a teaching about John 15, the vine in the branches and pruning. And she had a vine, a, a grapevine. And she said, I think that people don't always realize that the branches that were pruned weren't only the dead ones. And she told the story of the growth of the vine um, up her back wall, down the fence and around. And she held up a branch and had these tiny, tiny little grapes on it. And she said, these grapes are never going to grow any larger because most of the energy of the vine is being used to grow branches that have no grapes on them. And so the pruning is pruning branches that are sapping all of the energy and are very alive, but are not bearing fruit. And she said, those are the branches that get pruned. And, you know, I, that was eye-opening for me yeah. to say, there's deadness in my life that needs to be pruned. But then there's a lot of distraction. There's a lot of diversion away from things that would take our focus off of the Lord that also need to be pruned because they're sapping the energy out of prayer, faith focus on the apostolate, works of, of mercy, reaching out with the gospel. And so I think that there's a lot of pruning there too. What do you, what do you think, Father? I, I, compl I could not agree more. And um, Father, by the way, I really like you. You've said to that like two times now in the interview. So you're, you're certainly, uh, you, you're setting yourself up for more interviews with me if you okay. keep talking like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, well, would John let me know what the, what maybe some of the, basic understanding of what we were going to be having a conversation about. I know my, my mind first went to the pruning, the pruning away. And maybe, uh, and I, 
and, and I thought of dead branches. I can't say I thought of pruning away live and fruitless branches. Now, the Elijah moment, you know, Jesus gets to that point, either you're with me or you're against me. And, and it's not even that, that there is a, a fruitlessness. It is the recognition that I do not work for the gospel as it is taught by the Catholic Church. Even people who are in the church, who, who maybe even have a position of authority in the church, will have to come to that place where, I mean, and you call it a Luther moment, if you will, okay? You could call it, you know, a, a, a King Henry moment. But whatever it may be, you know, although um, the Elijah moment and then at the same time, the, um, the, the fruitless things that are taking a lot of our energy and identifying them. I'm going to have to bring that to prayer. You know, I'm going to have to bring that to to and and, and I have to say, you know, I, I, I'm so happy. I mean, I have a wonderful bishop. And I, and I know a handful, I don't know many bishops, okay, I don't, I mean, but the, the, the few bishops that, that, I'm, that I'm aware of pretty well, you know, either have seen where we came from and recognize, beginning to kind of having that moment of clarity, okay, like something has not worked, okay, and then at the same time, uh, you know, you said, how does a man become a bishop? He becomes a bishop by being a, a, an obedient servant to the church. And that may have been defined by not rocking the boat. And so getting kind of St. Paul to be ordained a bishop would be tough, you know, I mean, because he, he made a lot of enemies, you know. And so, and so we used to joke about that, that St. Paul would have been kicked out of the seminary on the third day, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's, that's a shame in a sense, okay? But um, yeah, so the church and in each one of us to, to be pruned that we may grow, you know, yeah. Amen. Well, that's Father Michael O'Connor. Father O'Connor, we're up against the end of our time for today, but I have enjoyed this conversation so very much. We barely scratched the surface of the things I wanted to talk to you about. So if you're open to it, I'd love to have you on again sometime. Uh, and just continue these conversations. It's a, uh, yeah, it, it's a, it's an inspiration. It's an, it's a real encouragement to talk to you and, and to hear you share the way, the way you do. So, Father, thank you, and I, and I hope you'll be open to coming back sometime. Of course, Tom. I, I appreciate the conversation. I enjoyed speaking with you and, and getting to know you a little bit. And I, I hope so. I hope we can do this again. Indeed. That's Father Michael O'Connor. Again, I encourage you to go check out his YouTube channel. Just type in his name, Father Michael O'Connor, and you'll find him on YouTube. His homilies are amazing. Thank you, Father O'Connor, for joining me today. And it's been my privilege. And thank you for having me.